let me ask you, why do you think that uh, Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. It's all true. It's all real. Nothing here is fake. Nothing you see on this show is fake. It's merely controlled. Hey guys, today we have Massimo, author, evolutionary scientist, turned practical philosopher. Massimo, welcome to The Truman Show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, let's start with the basic of what you already know. What is Stoicism in layman's terms? Uh, that's a good question. Stoicism is a Greco-Roman philosophy uh, which started about the 4th century BCE. And the goal of the philosophy is to make us a better human being. In fact, to make us the best human being you can possibly be. Uh, the way to do that, according to Stoicism, is to practice something they call virtue. Virtue is a word that comes from the Greek arete, which literally means uh, the best you can be. Uh, so it's, it's about becoming the best kind of person, human being, that one can possibly be. According to Stoicism, that means cultivate your ability to reason because human beings solve their problems by reasoning, uh, not by you know, not because we have big muscles or we can fly or we can, you know, swim fast or anything like that. We just have this little thing inside the brain exactly. and we can reason. And second, uh, it means to be pro-social, that is, to be good at cooperating with other people in order to make society a better place. So essentially, Stoicism is a pro-social philosophy based on reason. Oh, that's a, that's a really good answer. That's one thing I notice is like, if you go to the Asian traditions and cultures, you see that it's mainly more of a tribalistic culture in mm -hmm. which there's more social, social bonding involved. People interact more. That's one thing I've noticed right now. I'm living in Canada. And when I came to Canada, I see that the Western culture is more like individual focused, where you tend to reason yourself out into situations more. So do you, uh, do you see Stoicism as kind of like the balanced version of these two that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, s often people uh, notice that there are a lot of similarities between Stoicism and some Eastern philosophies, especially Buddhism, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the ethics, not the metaphysics. Their metaphysics beliefs are very different between the Stoics and the, and the Buddhists. But in terms of ethics, in terms of how to actually live your life, uh, they, they tend to be fairly similar. Yeah, I think that broadly speaking, you're right. There is this tendency of Eastern cultures to focus more on sort of the group, essentially, and of Western culture to focus on individuals. The Stoics did not make that distinction. They said, look, you are individual. Yes, you have your own you know, needs and wants and everything, but those needs and wants can only be satisfied within a society that works well, that functions well. Therefore, there really is no fundamental separation between individuals and society. What is, as Marcus Aurelius, one of the most important Stoics, puts it, whatever works for, for the hive works also for the bees and vice versa. So there really is no sharp distinction. In that sense, I do think Stoicism kind of gets the best of both approaches. Yeah, that's what I figured too. Well, since that you spoke about Marcus Aurelius, I was uh, listening to one of your talks the other day and um, you see that I was uh, seeing Nelson Mandela reading his book. Yes. Uh, and that kind of changed his whole world perspective and it kind of puts you, makes you think like how some thought patterns or even one idea, one simple idea can really have an impact on the world. Yeah, that is correct. So apparently uh, Mandela found a copy of the meditations. It was kind of snuck into the, the prison by one of his uh, fellow inmates. And at that point, Mandela was undergoing a phase where he was obviously and understandably very angry. Right. Uh, he was, you know, he was in jail for no, no, no good reasons. Uh, his people were, was, uh, was oppressed. So it, clearly this was not a good point in his life. Uh, he had a lot of anger and resentment as it's normal that one would, would have under those circumstances. But then he read Marcus Rudis's meditations where Marcus talks over and over about reaching out to other people, even bad people, because bad people are still human beings and they still have 
you know, they still care about their family, their children, they, they, they care about their, their stuff, and uh, just because they behave badly toward us, that doesn't mean that they are sort of intrinsically evil. They're just making mistakes. They just don't know better. They do things because, in a sense, out of ignorance, ethical ignorance, not, not in the right. sense that they're, you know, they don't have a college degree, but in the sense that they have ethical ignorance. And um, Mandela was, was struck by this uh, thought, and he started practicing it. He basically reached out to his jailers, to his, to his uh, tormentors, and, uh, and established relationships with them. And that kind of approach served him well, not only in prison, but after that, uh, when he was uh, freed and eventually became president of South Africa, he kept approaching things in the same way as trying to be uh, outreaching, you know, reaching out to people, trying to uh, settle things in an amicable way if possible. Now, that doesn't mean that you do not oppose injustice, for instance, or that you don't, you know, that just sit there and let things happen. Uh, sometimes people misunderstand stoicism as a kind of a, uh, as, as a philosophy that turns people into doormats. It's like you just sit back oh. and, you know, and take it. That clearly is not what uh, Mandela did. That's also clearly not what Marcus Aurelius or any of the other Stoics did. But there is a difference between uh, being a doormat and, and trying to just remind yourself that even your enemy is still a human being. Even your enemy is still somebody who is making mistakes and he thinks he's right. You know, even, even the, the worst possible human being you can think of, uh, they probably think they're right. They probably th think of themselves as actually being good and doing the right thing and that, that sort of thing. I mean, unless they're psychopaths. Uh, and even, even psychopaths probably think that way. So it helps dealing with people if you actively, mindfully remind yourself that these are not monsters, these are just misguided human beings. Yes, I think that's also one of the core philosophies in Buddhism, like ignorance is the root cause of all evil in the world. It's just that you don't have the right information. But anyways, reading that story from Mandela it kind of like blew my mind how how these thoughts can just transcend time and go through and if it goes to the hands of the right person, how it can have a drastic impact on the world. Right? Exactly. So that, that's essentially one of the good reasons why we should have more conversations. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you just mentioned, you know, ignorance is the root of all evil. That's also a phrase that is attributed to Plato. Um, and so it's another com confluence between a convergence between Eastern and Western uh, tra wisdom traditions. Right, 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 right. So uh, Spider-Man is your favorite fictional stoic with great power comes great responsibility. For humans, is it the other way around? With great responsibility comes <laughs> great power. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the question here, the, the issue is that of role models. The Stoics think that in order to improve ourselves, to become better human beings, we can do a number of things. And one of the things we can do is to pick a role model, or even more than one role model, and trying to pattern our behavior after that of the role model. Now, the role model doesn't have to be a living person. It doesn't even have to be an actual person, you know, somebody who exists. It can be a fictional character. Uh, or it can be somebody you knew. Uh, in my case, for instance, other than Spider-Man, I uh, think of my grandfather, uh, with whom I grew up, as a role model because he was a very ethical person. He was a very nice guy. You know, he always was... I never saw him upset or angry at anybody. Uh, he was trying to do the right thing uh, by other people. Now, however, the Stoics also did use fictional role models. The ancient Stoics used Odysseus, for instance, as one okay. of their role models. Well, why? Because he was smart, so he had reason. You know, he was capable of, of uh, sophisticated, you know, reasoning and, and reasoning. Uh, application of rationality. He was brave. Uh, he tried for 10 years to bring back his, his crew from the, from the Trojan War back to Ithaca at home. And he was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to get back to his family, basically, right? To, to uh, see his, his wife and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, his, and his son. So in, in, those, in that sense, uh, Odysseus is a good role model. Now, in modern times, not many people think about Odysseus. Uh, so you might want to pick somebody else. And Spider-Man, it's, it's a good example of a fictional <laughs> role model because, as you know, if you're familiar with the story, 
you know that, of course, uh, Peter Parker is, gets, gets bitten by a uh, radioactive spider that somehow, let's you know, forget the actual science about, about this <laughs> thing, this story, but somehow gives him these incredible powers. Initially, he, uses, he tries to use these powers to make money like most people would probably do. So, yeah. so he signs up to participate in, in uh, fights un in underground New York and get money that way. And of course, it's working very well because he has superpower. Uh, so he, he can you know, easily beat his opponents. But then at some point, uh, his uncle, with whom he grew up, is killed. And he's killed in part because Peter Parker does not intervene. He, s he sees uh, this, this guy who eventually later w will go on to kill his uncle running away, uh, he knows that he's, he's done something bad, but it doesn't stop him because he thinks, this is not my concern, this is not my, my thing. The, the police can deal with it, I don't, I don't do these kind of things. But then, as a result of his inaction, his, uh, his uncle dies. So from that moment on, Peter decides that actually he has great powers, he has been given by chance great powers, and the right thing to do is to use those powers responsibly, not just to make money, not just to make your life better, but actually to help other people. Now, of course, we don't have, as you were saying earlier, we don't, we don't have superpowers, but we do have power. Uh, we have power at oh. varying degrees of power. Of course, if you are uh, you know, the politician or the president of the United States, you have a lot of power, but even the two of us have power because we influence other people. Uh, we may be somebody's boss, or we may be somebody's friend, or we may be somebody's you know, colleague, uh, that gives us power to influence other people, power to do things for other people. And that power, according to the Stoics, needs to be used wisely. You, you should try to be helpful to other people, uh, not get in their way, not, you know, mistreat them and, uh, or treat them unfairly. Right, right. Since you spoke about power, how can a Stoic train himself so that he can exercise more power to lead a more virtuous life? There are several ways in which uh, Stoics train themselves. There are actually uh, a set of exercises that sometimes are referred to as spiritual exercises uh, in the sense that they help your spirit, meaning your character, who you are. Okay. Uh, there is a number of them that you find in the Stoic literature. Uh, a few years ago, with a friend of mine, Greg Lopez, we actually wrote a book called The Handbook for New Stoics that uh, lists 52, details 52 of these exercises. So there is a large literature uh, out there about this. And you know, people can use some or all of those exercises uh, to become better, better human beings. But some of my favorite uh, are particularly, and are particularly effective. One of them is uh, sometimes referred to as philosophical journaling. So you know, a lot of people keep a diary of what happens to them. Right, and um, and they write in their diary things like, "Oh, today I got upset with my friend, and you know, here's what happened." Blah blah blah. Well, a philosophical journal is like a diary, but it has a very specific uh, goal, and and it, it it is done in a certain in a certain way. So basically, before going to bed, you kind of open up your computer, or you write, you know, in a, in an actual diary if you if you still use a you know pen and paper and that sort of stuff. And uh, you ask yourself, well, so what happened today that was challenging? What happened today that I maybe did not exactly handle well? So again, examples can be things like a uh, fight with a colleague or, we, or, or, or a bad interaction with your boss or maybe something did not go well with your kids or with your partner or something like that. So you write down uh, the details of what happened as much as it is possible, not using emotional language, but using analytical language. That is, you want to analyze what happened, because the, no, the idea is not to relive it, or to, you know, to sort of emotionally get involved again into what happened, uh, because that's not very helpful. The goal is to analyze it in as objective a fashion as possible so that you can learn from what happened, right? So, oh, I reacted this way. Well, why did I react this way? How could I have reacted better? If something like this happens again next time, what should I do under those uh, conditions? And so on and so forth. And another trick about the journaling uh, is to write it in the second person, as if you were writing to a friend. So instead of saying, okay. I did that, you say, you did that, right? Now, why would you want to do that? 
Well, because there is actually evidence from modern, from modern cognitive behavioral science that if you write things in the second, you know, if you write these kind of things in, a, in the second person, it helps you take a, a distance between your emotional reaction and your analysis of what happened. So it's helpful because, you're, it, as I said, it's, it's like writing a letter to a friend. When you write a letter to a friend, you yeah. don't get upset. You try to get uh, to be helpful, to be constructive, not not to be upset, not not to get upset with your friend. So that is one of my favorite techniques. It helps because if you keep doing it, I do it pretty much every day. But you can also do it, you know, just a few times a week, and it only takes a few minutes. What ha what that does is it makes you more attentive, more mindful to your own shortcomings and even your own strengths because you also notice the situation in which you actually did well, you reacted well. And so the idea is that over time you kind of create a record of your reactions to setbacks or challenges so that you can learn and improve to deal with setbacks and, and challenges. So that's one stoic exercise. The second one we already mentioned, the pick up a, a role model and, uh, and trying to pattern your behavior according to your role model. So. If your role model is your grandfather, as in my case, for instance, you know, when you're faced with, a, again, a challenge or a setback, you ask yourself, the first thing you ask yourself is, how, what, what would my grandfather actually do? If he were here, how would he react to that kind of situation? Uh, let me mention one more exercise because I find it extremely helpful. This has to do with what the Stoic Epictetus called the fundamental rule of life. Epictetus was a uh, Stoic philosopher of the late first century, early second century. He actually started out his, uh, his life as a slave and then eventually was freed and he was allowed to uh, learn philosophy from one of the best teachers in Rome at the time, Musonius Rufus, and then eventually he, he started practicing philosophy and teaching philosophy. Now he had this idea that there is one fundamental rule in life that we should apply always under all circumstances and this rule is that some things are up to us and other things are not up to us and that a good life consists in focusing our attention on the things that are up to us and developing an attitude of acceptance and equanimity toward the things that are not up to us so for instance let's say you know i travel a lot so uh, often it does happen or at least from time to time it does happen i get to the airport and of course my flight is cancelled Right. Now, I tend to observe what other people do, and you know, you see all sorts of reactions. Um, you see people that get really angry, that start yelling at, uh, at the, the, the employee, you know, the airline employee, uh, as if yelling would actually help. Right, as living if, in reactions. Right, uh, you know, as if getting upset uh, and angry would actually magically make a, a new airplane appear uh, and solve the problem. Instead, what Epictetus would say is, is like, okay, the first thing, now, now you're facing a challenge. The challenge is you had a whole day, presumably, or even a week uh, programmed. You were supposed to be in a particular place at a particular time doing certain things. Now you can't do that, or at least not in the way you thought. So now you have a challenge. At the beginning of the challenge, you ask yourself, what here is up to me and what is not? And the answer may be something. You, actually, you literally make a list. You make two lists. If you have uh, you know, a piece of paper, you write them down. Otherwise, mentally, uh, you make two lists and you say, okay, what is up to me here? Well, first of all, try to rebook your flight. Instead of yelling at the, at the airline employee, who usually is not actually in a position of rebooking you, just open up your app on your phone, where you know, your, your airline's app, and go there because that's actually where you can act. Where you, can act. you can rebook yourself. Now, assuming that you did rebook yourself, then what else is up to you? Well, now your next flight is like three hours down the road. Okay, well, instead of being upset and you're just pacing up and down and stuff like that, um, you can open a book and, and read. You can open your computer and catch up with email. If you are with a friend or with your partner, uh, you can go to a restaurant, to a bar, and get a nice drink and chat about things. There are all sorts of things that you can do to pass the time and to use your time in a positive fashion. What is not up to you? Well, making the, the airplane appear magically is not up to you. Uh, changing the mind of the, air, uh, the airplane, uh, you know, air company employee is not up to you. 
Arriving on time where you were supposed to be is also not up to you. So you might need to contact whoever was waiting for you. That, that's up to you. You can call them up. You can send them an email and say, look, something outside of my control happened. Uh, here's what the new itinerary is like. Uh, you know, we can make arrangements. So that kind of thing does, that kind of approach that Epictetus suggests does two things. First of all, it actually allows you to deal with the challenge effectively. Right. It's not, it's, right. It's, you actually are doing things, you're actually solving the problem instead of just yelling or, or, or pacing up and down. And second of all, it makes you feel better because you have agency. We, one of the things that frustrates, frustrates us the most is when we are unable to act. When there is a problem and we don't know what to do or we cannot do anything, that frustrates mm. us. That increases our anger or our anxiety. Uh, we're not, we don't react well when we cannot do anything. The fundamental rule, applying the fundamental rule, on the other hand, means that now you have a list of things to do, right? You go to the app to reschedule your, 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 your flight. You call the person that was supposed to pick you up at the airport and alert them that something is going on. You read a book or catch up your email. All of those are things that you're doing. So your mind now is focused on the things that you're doing as opposed to the, the things that you cannot do. And therefore, you don't get as upset as you might have otherwise. Essentially, using more of your reasoning capabilities to lessen your stress, worries, have a more stable, equanimous life. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Oh, but uh, now that you said that, by I have to ask this question. Like, uh, it's more of like a emotional upsurge that overtakes your reason, right? When yeah. when when things don't go our way. Yep. So how can how can one practically deal or with an emotional response that comes out from the body so that uh, they do not lose their stability? Yeah, that is an excellent question. So a lot of people say things like, "Oh, I can't help it. I just feel that way," as if as if emotions were completely uncontrollable and you know it's like ah, there's nothing. It's not really me. It's my emotions. But that's a false view of emotions. Even mo not only the Stoics, but modern science tell you that emotions actually have what is called the cognitive component. That is, emotions are a type of reasoning. They're, they're, not, com they're not completely separate from reasoning. Yeah. So it's not like, you know, we, we, we have these, um, a lot of people think of this model of the mind, which goes back to Plato, actually, and eventually with some changes to Freud. But, but that model is wrong. It's not that there is reason on the one hand and emotion on the other hand and the two clash and, they don't, and you, can't, you can't make them agree. The, actual, the way in which the mind actually works, according to modern science, is that emotions have this cognitive component. What does that mean? So for instance, if you're getting angry at somebody, right? And I can mm -hmm. see it. We, you know, we're friends, and I can see you that you know, you're getting really upset because somebody said something to you. Uh, if I ask you, you know, why are you getting upset? Why are you getting angry? You will be able to give me an explanation. You would say things like, well, that guy was offensive. He said this and that and the other, and you know, that was uh, an offensive thing to say, and you know, these insults is a, it's a, are a bad thing, so of course I'm upset. In other words, you will be able to cognitively, reasonably explain to me why you're experiencing that emotion, which means that the emotion itself is actually based on those very reasons you're, you're giving me, <laughs> right? It's just that you don't know it. <laughs> it's just that you don't know it until I ask you the question and you start thinking about it. It's like, oh, yeah, why am I upset here? Oh, I'm upset because of this and that and the other. Now, the way stoicism works, in fact, not just stoicism, but modern cognitive behavioral therapy, which is one of the most effective evidence-based type of psychotherapy, and which, when it got started back in the 60s, was actually uh, originally uh, took, took shape from influenced by, by Stoicism. The early CBT practitioners actually read the Stoics. They read Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, and they thought, hey, these guys are onto something here. Maybe, maybe we can work with this. So cognitive behavioral therapy and Stoicism both tell you that the way to, do it, to approach this situation is by challenging your emotions. So you feel you're getting upset. You feel you're getting angry, right? You have no control over that part. I mean, the feeling, the, the, the basic feeling is like it just happens. But once you realize that it's happening, now you can intervene. 
you can ask yourself questions. Literally talk to yourself, right? Talk to your emotions and say, okay, why am I being upset? Oh, because I got insulted. But why is an insult something that I should get upset about? I mean, after all, an insult, you can reconstruct, you can, you can uh, essentially tell yourself a story about what insults are, and that story is going to challenge your uh, assumed story that you already have, but you were not aware of. So we, most people assume, for instance, that an insult is something that, of course, is going to make you upset because it's uh, somebody saying bad things about you that are not true. But Epictetus says, and why is that going to upset you? I mean, after all, it's his problem. If, if, if the guy is telling you stuff that is not true, then it's his problem. He's making a mistake. Why are you getting upset about it? In fact, you getting upset about it actually does exactly what the other person wants. If somebody insults you, their goal is to make you upset. Because what else are they going to try to do? They're trying to make you upset. So if you actually do get upset, you simply just gave them the win, right? You, you're doing exactly what they want. If instead you talk to yourself and you say, look, an insult is only somebody opening their mouth and moving some air. And then that air hits my ears and, and somehow I get upset. Why the hell should I get upset when, my, when some air eats my ears? I'm just going to ignore it. So Epictetus says there are two ways to respond to insults. The, the simplest one is simply to ignore it. Just keep walking. Just disengage. Just go somewhere else. You'll see that the person that insulted you is going to get really flustered. He's going to get upset because he's not getting the reaction that he wants. Right? Yes. Uh, you that, just walk in Energy away. is not getting transferred. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's not doing what he, what he wants. The other way for, for advanced students, so to speak, is to respond, with, respond to, the, to an insult with self-deprecating humor because nothing puts down people more than self-deprecating -de humor. For instance, uh, uh, there is a case in the Discourses, a book by Epictetus, uh, well, it wasn't written by Epictetus, it was written by one of his students, but it's a, st it's a book about uh, Epictetus' philosophy. And in the discourses, there is this story where a student comes to Epictetus and says, and says you know, this guy is talking, he's, he's saying bad things about you, and he's saying this and that and the other. And Epictetus looks at the student and says, oh, that's just because he doesn't know me well, because if he knew me well, he could do much worse than that. He could say, <laughs> he could be insulting me much more efficiently. And of course, what are you going to do if somebody responds that way? You have to laugh or, or, <laughs> or you're going to get yourself upset because you didn't land the, the, the punch there. So more generally, the idea is that emotions are not something that just happened to us. Emotions are reactions to events uh, or to what, to what people do or say that are based on certain assumptions that we have about the world. And the idea is to challenge those assumptions. Look at those assumptions and which right. might be wrong. Right. Now, of course, it takes time. It takes, it takes effort and it takes practice. You know, it, it's, you're not going to be able to do it just overnight. You know, now that I just told you how it works, uh, you may still get upset the next time that somebody uh, insults you because it takes effort. It takes mindful effort. It takes, uh, um, there are some techniques that the Stoics suggest, for instance, Seneca wrote an entire book called On Anger, mm -hmm. where he says the first thing you need to do is to put some distance between yourself and your emotions. So disengage. So if you're feeling yourself getting upset, getting uh, anxious, or getting angry, you should disengage. There are many ways of disengaging. You can, you know, the classical one is you just start talk, uh, 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 counting to 100 in your head. Or, or saying the alphabet in your head so that your, your mind is distracted. It's not, it's not actually focused on the anger. Or you can just go for a walk if, it, if that's a possibility. Or you can go to the bathroom, excuse yourself and go to the bathroom and, and just stay there for a few minutes until you feel yourself recovering. Once you're recovering, that is once that the anger, and the anger always naturally subsides. It doesn't last uh, if, if you don't feed it, if you don't actually engage with the situation, it doesn't last. Once your, your anger is gone down a little bit, then you can start the practice of asking yourself, challenging yourself and say, what the hell was going on there? Why was I getting so upset? And, and little by little, you can build an alternative narrative 
which eventually becomes your dominant narrative. The next time, at some point, the next time that somebody insults you, you you're just going to walk away. And it's not going to... Yeah. It's as though your mind catches some kind of inertia. The longer you're in it, it's right. like being in quicksand, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's a yes. good analogy to put it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You don't want to react just in, in automatically, basically. You want to stop, take your time. You know, you know the famous Nike commercial, you know, just do it? It's kind of the opposite <laughs> of that. Don't just do don't it. Just do it. stop, <laughs> slow down, think about it, and then, and then decide whether it's a good thing to do or not. That's a really good point. Uh, how does ego come into this mix? Is, is it like your, your reactions are, is it like def your ego defending its authenticity in some manner? Yeah, actually, that is one of those um, th places where Stoicism and Buddhism actually get to a, a very similar point. You know, you often hear that uh, Buddhists deny the existence of the ego, but that's not quite true, or the self. That's not quite right. From what I understand, what the Buddhists are saying is that there is no permanent essence that is your ego or, or your self that yourself is a dynamic set of processes. It changes all the time, basically. Oh, yeah, I, I read, I remember reading, like, when you're born, you're, like, pure. And when you live through your different ages, you just get impure. And when you die, you, you get pure again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ideally, at least that's the situation. Now, the Stoics have a s very similar perception of, of the ego or the self. Basically, they say, look, yourself is simply the bundle of all of your thoughts and reactions and experiences and memories and so on and so forth. So of course it changes throughout your life because you have more experiences, you have more memories, you forget some things uh, that you've experienced in the past. So your yourself is, uh, is constantly changing. Right? I am not the same person that I was yesterday. I'm certainly not the same person that I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And yet in some sense there is continuity. Uh, between those people, right? I can say, I can point to a photo of myself 20 years ago and I'd say, yeah, that's me. But it's not the same me that I am now because in the meantime, 20 years of experiences have, have happened, right? That that person did not actually have. So the Stoics would say, right, you need, what you need to do in order to cope with life in a better way is to little by little remold yourself. You do that mindfully. You pay attention to who you are and what is happening to you, and you get yourself in charge of actually deciding who you want to be and not just react passively, you know, react kind of in a, in a reflective fashion. You pay attention. One of the phrases that uh, Epictetus uses often is uh, prosoke, and prosoke is gre Greek for attention. It just it t tells to his students constantly, you, you just pay attention. He says, nothing has ever been improved by not paying attention to it. Uh, in, uh, in one of his examples is um, uh, the pilot of a ship. And he says, you know, when was the last time that you, you encountered a pilot whose who's, uh, piloting was made better by not paying attention? <laughs> if he doesn't pay attention, very likely what's going to happen is that the ship is going to go down uh, and it's going to be a lot, of, a lot of trouble. So in a sense... Um, the Stoics are saying we should be paying attention. Paying attention to what? Well, paying attention to who we are, who we want to be, and how we react to whatever happens to us. Instead of passively taking on board or passively reacting to things, we need to do it proactively. We need to be mindful right, right. about it. That's actually another question that I had in mind. Like with the modern age, I with all the digital influence that we have, almost a person spends like 40 to 50, 40 to 60 percent of their conscious time when they're awake on their phones, cell phones, etc. Yep. And uh, all this, I feel, uh, is directing the youth to more or less of a, a passive state of existence rather than finding your own perspective or your own individuality and your own perspectives and your own findings in life. Um, so do, do you think that it's, 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 it's inversely affecting our society? Oh yeah, and it's not, it's not just my opinion. This, there's actually research by uh, kind of these psychologists and social psychologists that shows that there is a lot of negative effects 
uh, of social media, of spending a lot of time on the internet, and so on and so forth. Of course, there are also good things about it. I mean, it, like right. like any technology, you know, it can be used for good and for evil. It's not like everything. You you need to learn every, uh, learn to use every technology as a tool, right? Rather exactly. than it controlling you. I think Correct. most people are blind of that fact or what that's exactly <laughs> right and the reason is they're not using the technology mindfully they're using it as it's given to them by the companies that make a lot of money out of exploiting uh, the you know the uh, their users so yeah i do think that stoicism in particular but also buddhism teaches us to use things not just technology but anything in our life mindfully why am i doing this is this something actually good for me to, to, do, to do or should I spend my time doing other things? And look, I apply this to pretty much everything. So I, used to sp I was one of the, of the early adopters of, I'm usually an early adopter of technology. So when, when something new comes out, usually I take a look at it and say, okay, let's play with this thing. And so I, had, uh, I was on Facebook and Twitter, for instance, for a long time because I was one of the, their first users. But then recently I said, you know, this is not doing enough good in my life. It's doing a lot of damage, in fact. Uh, you, I tend to s waste time to get upset about things that I read. Uh, it's not really conducive to any good for me, so I just quit. I thought about it for, for a time. I talked to friends and family. I talked to other people. I read about research uh, on, uh, on the effect of social media, and then at some point I said, okay, that's it. The overall, this is not a good thing for me. So I decided to quit. Now, you can, instead of quitting, you can also decide to actually use technology to help you control the use of technology, right? As you know, there are uh, lots of apps that measure your, the amount of time you spend on, right. on social media, for instance, and they will block you. You can set, th set them so that, okay, you've done half an hour, that's it. That's your allotment for the day, and then they'll, they'll block you. So there are tools that we can use if, if our own... Uh, sort of re resolve is not enough. There are tools that you can use. I apply this also to things like en entertainment and relaxation. I mean, the Stoics clearly uh, thought that although we should be spending our time doing things that are good for humanity and good for us, nevertheless, everybody needs to relax and everybody needs a vacation. You know, everybody needs to to recharge their batteries. So. One of the ways in which I recharge my batteries is after dinner, I watch an hour or two of television. But I do it mindfully. I, I canceled my uh, cable subscription because I found myself otherwise, you know, just flipping channels for Binge two hours it. and, you know, <laughs> right. And, and then not, then get frustrated at the end of the evening and say, okay, what did I do? Nothing good. So instead, I uh, subscribe to a select number of streaming services. I pick what I want to watch. Uh, and I only watch that. So it's like, okay, tonight I'm going to do this. And that's because that's a good show. It's entertaining. It's fine. But then after that, that's it. Stop and I and do something else. I'm going to read a book or I'm going to listen to some music or you know, I, I do something else with, with my life. So you can do that. And it's, it's about living in a more purposeful, mindful fashion as opposed to just hap, you know, ha let, let life happen to you. Right, right. Uh, but when you look at Gen Z children or the modern youth in particular, uh, they don't like advices in any matter, but it's very hard to convince a person what it really means to live a life that is, you know, worth, <laughs> worth pursuing, like pursuing for a, a long-term goal maybe. Yeah. Right? But yeah. is, there, is there a way like you can... Uh, make them open their mind. Is it possible to give a strong why to yeah. the modern youth? It's a good question. So, so I have a daughter that falls into that sort of generation. Actually, she's borderline between a millennium, millennial and a, and a Gen Z. Uh, and she actually is doing very well. She does live a very purposeful life. She's a journalist and, and all that. But I think the result of that is because of her education since she was a child. Uh, mm. Again, this is not just my experience, this is also modern science telling us this. Uh, the way to educate people is to get them early. Uh, social psychologists, developmental psychologists will tell you that the crucial period of education of a person is actually between the ages of seven and, teenager, and teenage years, um, but especially early on. 
Why? Because that's the so-called age of reason. That's the age where kids are, are capable of developing abstract thinking. They are absorbing a lot of information. They're curious about stuff. By the time they get to teenage, to, uh, to teenage years, the problem there is that the, you know, the hormones start working and therefore they get distracted, they get less focused, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you build a good base in the years before teenage, uh, then, then, then those are the kids that actually deal well with the challenges of sort of the hormonal phase of life. And then those are also the, the, the kids that eventually when they become adults, they actually have the tools to deal well with whatever challenge they may face. But to convince somebody out of the blue, you know, if, uh, if I were to talk to somebody who is now 20 or 25 or 20, 23, and just out of blue and say, hey, you know what? You should be living a more mindful life. I'm, <laughs> I am pretty positive that wouldn't go down very well. It's in a sense too late for those people for now. Hmm. But what happens, they're going to have a second chance because eventually life is going to present them with challenges and setbacks, right? So typically, I mean, People's lives go in different ways. But typically, uh, people tend to be very optimistic about what they can do when they're in their 20s because they feel invulnerable. They feel like, you know, the world is mine. I can do everything. And to some extent, that's true. They can do all sorts of things. But then they get married or they have a partner. They have kids or not. They, have, they embark in a career. And then challenges and setbacks start accumulating. And then typically, they'll get to a point of crisis they'll get to a point where they're going to start asking themselves, what the hell am I doing here? You know, is, is this all there is uh, to life? You know, maybe I, I made some mistake. That is their second chance. That's the time. In fact, a lot of people that are interested in stoicism tend to be older people, not, not really old, but older people, people that have gone through the first phase, uh, you know, the youth phase. They started getting challenges, facing challenges, and that's when they ask themselves, you know, wait a minute. Can I do better? And so that's why stoicism is very popular with people that are in their you know, late 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on. Mm. But that doesn't mean it can only help those people. It can help anybody who is just open-minded uh, and interested. So I do have you know, some of my readers, some of the readers of my books or my blog are in their much younger. They're in their 20s or even occasionally teenagers. But it's up to them. I cannot go to, to them and say, hey, have you heard the good news of stoicism? Uh, they have to be able to pick up a book or pick up a, you know, or read a blog or, or listen to a podcast, develop the curiosity and, and, and say, hey, maybe this applies to me. Maybe, maybe I can do better. So there are these three phases, right? So uh, pre-teenage, we can teach kids and if you do it well at that age, then they're going to be doing much better later on. Once they're in the, their teenage or early 20s, it's up to them. Some people will be open to you know, trying to do things in a different way, and other people will not, and there is not much we can do about it. But then if you wait long enough, there will be challenges and setbacks, and, and that's the time when there is another, open, another window that is open, and, and people are more uh, receptive to... Uh, what I call basically practical philosophy, because that's what stoicism is. It's a type of practical philosophy. Yeah, it's actually that that was one of the other questions I had in mind is like, uh, how would you like incorporating stoicism into the education system that we have right now? That, that would be a really good thought. Uh, anyways, I was uh, reading everything in our nature, at least in what we see is cyclic. It goes through different phases. And I, I was reading this interesting, and it felt interesting to me. It's like, Bad times give birth, birth to strong people. Strong people give birth to good times, and good times give birth to less strong people, right? <laughs> and the cycle and cycle repeats. Yep. And do you think like stoicism can kind of cut this in between? So right now, I, I believe we are in a phase where the times are relatively good when we look, at least when I look into my... Gen two generations back, at least when I look two generations yep. back, the conditions are relatively good where I live. And so do you think stoicism can offer an answer in cutting this cycle? So when times are good, you use your reason to take out the bad times from happening again. It's like, right. uh, wh what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, 
one of the misunderstandings about Stoicism is that it is a philosophy for the bad times, right? So, like, because it's about <laughs> no, no, resi- I, I, yeah, yeah. But because it's yeah. about resilience, right? Uh, resilience is a Stoic. Uh, it's certainly right. a Stoic value. It teaches right. uh, Stoicism teaches you how to uh, face, as we said, challenges, and setbacks, and stuff like that. But actually, Seneca says, you know, uh, the good times also require you to act. In a rational yeah, way, you know, in a I virtuous didn't mean way. Just to look at <laughs> no, no, I, I know you didn't. Just to look at <laughs> right, no, no, I, 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 yeah, I'm not saying that you did, but a lot of people do think that. Like, oh well, it's a good time, so I don't need anything. Well, actually, that's not true because, as you say, right. uh, if you're experiencing good times, then unfortunately, you can almost be guaranteed that the next, the next cycle is going to go down. It's not going to go up because you're already up. So if the only way you can go, it's down. So you need to be prepared. Yeah, uh, you need to, you know, ad- human beings are, uh, are kind of funny creatures because we can, f- we have a fairly sophisticated brain. We can think ahead. We know what's a lot of times what's coming and yet we don't do anything about it. Uh, we kind of ignore it. We put it out of our, of our mind. This is true at a personal as well as a, so- as, a so- as a social level. So at a personal level, for instance, right? So when you are in your 20s or 30s or 40s, you basically think you're immortal. You say, oh, I feel so good. Uh, you know, my career is going well. My love life is going well. I physically feel strong and all that. Yeah, but you know you're going to get old, right? I mean, you, you know you're going to be, if you're lucky, if you don't die earlier, you're going to get into your 60s and then 70s and then 80s. And at that point, you know, your life is going to be very different. Why don't you start working on that now? You know, right, right now when you are actually at, at your peak, that's the best time you can start, you know, setting a money uh, about, you know, money aside or going to the gym so that you can exercise so that your phys- physical abilities are going to stay longer, you know, uh, for, for a long period of time. That sort of stuff at an individual level. At a societal level, let's take uh, what unfortunately is still a, a controversial topic, climate change. We, we've known about climate change for decades it's not like this is a surprise. It's not like it came out of all, all of a sudden, all of the blue. You know, the, the pandemic did. The, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic, that one was out of the blue. Some people were predicting that at some point or another there would be a pandemic, but nobody was able to predict when and, and how. So that was really out of the blue, and actually we reacted pretty well. But climate change, it's one of those things that we've been know- knowing about for decades, and we keep not doing anything about it. And then at some point, the really bad stuff is going to happen, and then we're going to look around and we're going to say, oh my gosh, this is really bad stuff. Yeah, no kidding. And didn't you know it? <laughs> why, why did you not prepare uh, for it? So, yeah, to some extent, Stoicism and other philosophies are about breaking that kind of cycle um, in the sense that we, di- we do need to think two or three steps ahead. Uh, it's, it's fine to enjoy your good life if you have a good life right now. Absolutely. This isn't about you know, uh, creating problems for yourselves where, where, where there is no problem. Fine. Enjoy your life. But at the same time, be conscious of the fact that you know this isn't going to last forever. This is not going to be the rest of you know, the, the history of the universe. You're not going to go like, like this. Things are going to change. Things, you know, challenges will, will occur. Setbacks will, will, will take place. And you need to be prepared because as... Seneca again says, a prepared mind is a mind that actually deals with problems better than an unprepared mind. If you don't know, you know, think about it this way. I'm sure it has happened to you. It certainly has happened to me. Uh, sometimes you, you find yourself in situations that you never, oc- never occurred before. They, they never happened before. Um, and you don't, typically you don't react well because you don't know what to expect. You have no because experience. It's new. Yes. Right, it's new, right? So it's like, oh, well, shit. But what's going on? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what to do. But if you do pay attention to your own experiences, right, and you try to learn from them, that's the, the, the technique of journaling that I was talking about at the beginning of our conversation does that, then you are prepared. Um, you know, like I can give you a very simple, very silly example. This happened a number of years ago. So I was in, in New York, in, down in the village, and I was walking with a friend, and uh, suddenly I... I bumped into some, somebody else, you know, a woman, who was carrying coffee. And the coffee got spilled all over the place. And, you know, 
naturally, the first thing I said was, well, I'm sorry, although it wasn't actually my fault. She wasn't, she wasn't looking, <laughs> where, she was going. But nevertheless, you know, you're, you see that there is a human being in distress and all that. So you say, sorry. But then I started, I resumed walking because, you know, what else I could do? Uh, and she did something, you know, something else. I don't, I don't know what she did. But then I thought about that episode and I thought, okay, should this happen again or something like this happen again? The next time, don't just say that you're sorry. Offer to pay for the coffee. Even though it's not your fault, it doesn't matter. It's a nice gesture. It's only a coffee. It's only right. three bucks. Well, at Starbucks, it's probably more than that now. But nevertheless, it's a small amount of money. It's a nice gesture that all of a sudden turns a uh, little of an of a awkward situation into a bond with another human being. With right, a right. New it, thing. It, it's like when we get into new or anonymous situations, we kind of have this unconscious reactionary response that we go with. And it's, it's when you can switch that into mindfulness, a whole new world is born in some exactly. sense. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Uh, opposite of courage is not fear, but conformity. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, the courage is one of the four cardinal virtues that Stoics try to cultivate. The, the four cardinal virtues are wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. And Courage is defined uh, by the Stoics as mo moral courage, the courage to do the right thing. So it's not about going into battle and facing a deadly enemy, although that certainly does require courage uh, in some sense of the word, but it is about the courage to do the right thing. And so as you said, therefore, a, a Stoic would agree that the, the, the opposite of courage is, is letting things happen that, shouldn't, that you shouldn't uh, let happen. And we do that, unfortunately, all the time. I mean, we, we're not, we tend to be not courageous. We don't, we don't, <laughs> you know, we see a lot of bad stuff uh, that we could be doing something about, and we just don't. We, we just keep going, like Spider-Man, before he became Spider-Man, we just keep going on our, this is not our business, not my business, this is the police business, this has nothing to do with me. But in fact, it does have to do with you, because we are human beings. We're a member of what the Stoics call the human cosmopolis, the, the big mm. family, the big city of humanity. And so it doesn't matter whether it's a stranger or it's your wife or, or husband, or it doesn't matter whether the person lives on the other side of the world or it's your neighbor. They're all, we're all human beings. We all want and, and fear and, and the same kind of things. So, you know, just be a little bit nicer uh, to people. Just, uh, and this can be again, can take, you know, very, uh, very simple form. It's not, we're not talking about becoming Spider-Man and going and fight super villains here. But we're talking about like, you know, you watch on television, for instance, just, just today, I was watching on television the, the, about the fires in Hawaii and in, uh, and in Canada. So lots of people have lost their, their property, sometimes their lives. Uh, and, you know, they're having a really hard time. So, can you spare maybe a few bucks and send them to an organization that is working there on, on behalf of these people? I'm pretty sure everybody can do that. You know, it's like you don't have to spend thousands of dollars doing that. You can send a little bit of money. That is a nice gesture to help strangers because you'll never know. They will never know that you helped them. You will never know them, but you will know that you have helped them. You won't know them personally. They, you will not get a thank you letter from, from them, but it will make you feel better because you've done the right thing. You've done the virtuous thing. I read you turned, you turned from Buddhism to Stoicism. Did you find a difference? If so, what is the difference? I was curious. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Yes, so when I was uh, in going through my own midlife crisis, I tried out different approaches, different philosophies. And one of the very first ones that I tried out and started reading about and tried to uh, practice was Buddhism. And yeah, eventually it didn't work for me, which doesn't mean it, does, it wouldn't work for somebody else, of course, uh, because you know, these are highly personal things. I think when I thought, I thought back to it, and I think there are a number of reasons why it didn't work for me, mostly two reasons. One is, uh, I just cannot accept Buddhist metaphysics. So talk about um, things like reincarnation and karma. 
those from the point of view of somebody, I, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, I'm a biologist, that just doesn't, doesn't sit well with me. It's like, no, that's not the kind of thing that I can accept. Um, and therefore, I would have had to practice a type of Buddhism that, that is really unusual. I mean, there, is, there, is, uh, there are modern versions, secular versions of Buddhism that do away with the metaphysics pretty much altogether. But it's, it's, a, it's a minority of Buddhists. It's not really Buddhism in the way in which most people think of. The second reason, I think, was simply cultural. That is, when I started reading Buddhist, Buddhist um, uh, texts, they just didn't speak to me. The language was alien to me. I don't mean literally, because I obviously I was looking at English translations. I wasn't reading you know, Sanskrit or Pali. Um, but nevertheless, it, the imagery, the analogy, the metaphors that were used, the kind of language that was used, uh, was alien because, of course, I didn't grow up in that kind of culture. I was not exposed to that kind of culture. As soon as I picked up, on the other hand, Epictetus, he immediately spoke to me. He's like, oh, okay, I know what this guy's talking about. I, it, it really it resonated immediately. So some reasons, some of the reasons were cultural, and therefore, if I had had a different life experience, uh, I w would have probably responded much better. Other reasons were more fundamental. The metaphysics stuff is more fundamental. That one, regardless of the culture, would have been an obstacle for me. Um, nevertheless, Buddhism does have a lot of things, especially the ethics, that work very well. Uh, they have a lot of techniques, uh, you know, several, several kinds of meditations that do work. There is pretty good empirical evidence that they work for uh, some of the things that they claim. So I would say if, if Buddhism talk, speaks to you and, and, and you want to give it a try, then you should definitely do that. Uh, if it doesn't, then you might want to try something else. And Stoicism is just one of a number of alternatives. I don't think there is one philosophy of life that works. Right, I right. think there are multiple m ones. Um, and you just, you know, you might want to try uh, different things until something actually clicks and something... Not even all of the Western philosophies clicked with me. I read Epicurus, for instance, and I, that didn't do anything for me. I also read Aristotle, and it's like, okay, that's interesting, but it's not... I cannot see myself living my life as an Aristotelian. So, uh, so it doesn't have necessarily everything to do with, with a cultural background. Uh, now, that said... There are also philosophies of life that don't work, uh, that I think are actually destructive. I mean, there are obvious examples. If your philosophy of life is fascism, that's probably not a good thing. Uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's really anti-human in that sense because you're, you're thinking along lines that are destructive and, 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 and exploitative of other people. But there are other, yet other uh, philosophy, like for instance, uh, one of the popular ones in the United States for a while now, it's something called The Secret, uh, Secret. which is this, yeah, it's this n notion that if you really want something uh, like career change or, you know, getting better because you're sick or something like that, uh, you need to think about it really hard because the universe eventually will sort of turn itself so essentially like in a comedy. Like the law of attraction? Is yeah, the law of attraction, yes. exactly. Well, that's bullshit. Uh, it doesn't <laughs> work that way. And if you adopt that kind of philosophy of life, you actually end up not only be disappointed, but blaming yourself for the disappointment. Imagine somebody, for instance, who is, I don't know, struck by cancer, right? And who buys into the law of attraction and says, you know, if I think very hard about this thing, if I really want to get better, the, the cancer will go away. And then the cancer doesn't go away. Well, now, not only that person is stuck with cancer, but starts blaming herself for not being good enough uh, and you know, not being able to change things. That's, that's a horrible philosophy of life, and so I would stay away from that sort of stuff. Thoughts without action is useless in yeah. some level. <laughs> and sometimes con counterproductive, in fact. More, worse than useless. It can be actually deleterious. All right. Last question. I don't want to take more of your time. Uh, what are the limits of rationality or reason? Or are there any? Yeah, there are, absolutely. Um, rationality, you know, reason uh, is a human thing. You know, we evolved the ability to reason uh, our way through, uh, through our problems. Uh, evolutionary biologists still don't know exactly why we evolved these large brains capable of reason, but it, it, the most uh, likely hypothesis is that it has to do with the ability to, to coordinate action in a group. You know, human beings, even back to the place in the Pleistocene, 
survived because they were able to coordinate things, to do things together, like hunting prey, for in, large prey, for instance, together. And for that, you need a certain ability to communicate, you need language, uh, and that's why we got these large brains. So in other words, our ability to reason actually was given to us by nature in order to solve problems of cooperation with other human beings, which is exactly what the Stoics would say, even though the Stoics didn't know anything about evolution. But in a, in a modern sense, that's what they would say. Now, reason is an evolved characteristic, and as such, it has limitations, like anything else. Think of it, of reason as analogous as our evolutionary weapon, if you will. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's analogous to, I don't know, the fact that a gazelle can, can run very fast, right? That's their evolutionary weapon, running fast. But even that has limits. It's not like a gazelles can go to the speed of light. They, they only ha can, can do certain things, and at some point, uh, in some situations, that's not going to be enough, and they're going to you know, be prey of, of, of a lion or something like that. Uh, if you're a lion, your evolutionary weapon is strong muscles and big fangs. But even that has limits. You know, you, it's not like you can do everything you, you can possibly imagine with those things. So reason has limits. There are things we don't know. There are things we will probably never know because we're not smart enough or because we don't have access to enough information. We cannot process that kind of information. Uh, and I can give you examples. For instance, m I, I'm going to bet that we will never know how life originated on Earth, hmm. which is one of the major questions that scientists have been after for a long time. And the reason I'm saying this is not because there's anything magical about it, but it's just because there is no empirical evidence available. The, whatever happened in during the early stages of life on Earth, it's, it's been eliminated by, by geological changes. There's no fossil record. We have no idea of what the first living organism actually looked like. And if you don't know that, it seems to me next to impossible to figure out how life originated. So there are limits to reason. When I get a little bit worried is when people tell me that there are ways to go beyond reason. I don't even know what beyond reason actually means, beyond where, doing, doing what. <laughs> um, there are no alternative ways of knowledge. Reason is the only way that we have to figure out things. Uh, People can talk about mystical experiences, but as far as I'm concerned, mystical experiences are just hallucinations of the mind. And therefore, they're not a source of knowledge. They, are, they tell you something about your life, your mind. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, these days it's very popular to take hallucinogens, for instance, and, you know, have uh, sort of more or less controlled trips. And people tell me, I've talked to some of these people, that they have, they have amazing insights, new insights into you know, how the world works. And then yeah, I asked them, uh, like, what? And, and they, don't, they can't really tell me, oh, you have to experience it yourself. It's like, well, wait a minute here. Uh, you, you're making big claims, but then when I ask you actually, so what's, uh, what's the deal? You cannot, you cannot tell me. What those experiences do is they certainly generate altered states of consciousness, but what you experience there, what you feel under those conditions, tells you much more about your mind than about what the world out there is like. Um, other people tell me that a different way of knowledge is through religious revelation. But I don't believe in God, so I don't think there is any God out there that he actually re reveals anything to anybody. Again, I think those are human-made things. Those are, those are human experiences. There's nothing beyond reason. So reason has limits, but it's still our only weapon. It, it, if we want to solve problems, uh, evolution has given us this one as a, as a, as a weapon and so, or as a tool, if you don't like the weapon met metaphor. But as a tool, that's what we have. That is why it's so important that we appreciate it and we learn how to use it correctly. The Stoics thought that we need to focus on three areas of knowledge. One is ethics, which has to do with how to behave toward other people, how to become a better person, etc., etc. The second one is what we would today call science because they thought that learning something about how the world works actually helps you live in the world. Uh, I mentioned earlier the example of the law of attraction. If you know that the world doesn't work that way, then you're not going to buy into that kind of nonsense, right? Because, because you know better. And the third area of study was logic. 
by which they meant anything that has to do with human reasoning, not just formal logic, but anything, including you know, psychology, cognitive science, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why? Well, because that's how we work. That's how we, we roll. We, we use reason. That's how we make our way through the world. And so knowing how the human mind works, knowing how it doesn't work sometimes, you know, things like cognitive biases and logical fallacies and things like that, it's helpful because it helps you not making mm. certain mistakes. Right, 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 right. Uh, but I remember hearing this sentence from Anil Seth, if you know him, he, he was saying like, uh, what your mind generates is also hallucinations, but it's just that when we agree upon our hallucinations, we call that reality. Yeah, not exactly. I'm going to I'm <laughs> going to I'm going to counter. I'm going to push back on that one with a, 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 a phrase, a quote from uh, Philip K. Dick, who is a science okay. science fiction writer who said reality is the thing that once you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. Um, <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> it's not in your mind. Yes, to, there is some truth to the quote that you just gave, and that is uh, the human brain does create a virtual reality environment, essentially. So the way we perceive the world, you know, we, we, we have this uh, illusion that our eyes work like a camera. Like, you know, they, you look around and, and what you see is what you get and that's it. But that's, that's not the case. We know that the perceptive system, the human perceptive system is, is really complicated. And it's the brain that constantly creates essentially an image, a representation of the world as we perceive it through the senses. And you can convince yourself of that very easily. If you take a pencil, this is not a pencil, but if you take a pencil and you put it a certain distance to your, you know, the distance of your, your arm from your eyes, and then you move it from where you are slowly toward your back, at some point you will see your finger or your, or your pencil disappear, and then it will reappear again. The, pla pla the place where the pencil disappears is your blind spot. Mm. Uh, that area of your visual system where you actually do not perceive anything. Okay? But we're not aware of a blind spot normally. You know, to be aware of it, you have to do this little experiment with the, with the pencil. Normally, we see the world with continuity. That's because the, the human brain makes up for the difference. It fills the gaps. It kind of interpolates and makes it, which means that in a sense, you're right, we are, quote unquote, hallucinating. However, we are hallucinating a version of the world that is informed by our senses. And if the senses work well, that hallucination presumably is pretty close to reality. Not every hallucination is the same, is the same, <laughs> um, right? So, so if you hallucinate, for instance, that it would be good to jump out of the window because you can fly, I wouldn't do it if I were you, because you're not going to be able to fly, and you'll s go straight down because of something called the law of gravity. That's a real law. It actually exists, and, and you're going to smash on the, on the pavement. So I wouldn't do it. There are certain things that our brain tells us about reality that appear to work very well in terms of our survival and other things that don't work very well. Right. So I had a ton of other questions. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <laughs> next time. Didn't just time to cut them. <laughs> Maybe next time in in some future. But anyway, live a live a life with reason to have a good life. We'll end it on that. Sounds good. All right, that was Dr. Massimo Pellucci sharing his views on stoicism and how to lead your best life. Those who are interested in his books, blogs, or any of his works can reach him on his website that is mentioned in the link below. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe. And until I see you next time, good morning, good afternoon, and good night.